preachers of a different gospel. Have you seen them? The Bible has a lot to say about such preachers. Sometimes the Bible will call them false teachers. Sometimes it will call them false prophets. Sometimes it will identify them in forms of false teachings. For instance, in Matthew chapter 7, from verses 15, Jesus warns his followers, and he says, Watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. In fact, in Matthew 24, he takes it even further, when he says that some will come claiming to be the Christ, and to your surprise, they will even perform miracles and wonders, if possible to deceive even the elect. The Apostle Paul did not spare them either. He had a lot to talk about them. And one particular passage that I would like to bring to your attention is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, especially when you read from verses 3 uh, to verse 4. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. The Apostle Paul is addressing the church at Corinth. And as you look at the opening of his letter, he tells us that these were already believers in Christ, saints, saved, and sanctified. But surprisingly, they are believers who are still undiscerning. They cannot easily tell the difference between a true Jesus as revealed in the scriptures and a false one. And the Apostle Paul is expressing concern. He's saying, I am afraid you are about to be deceived. And he takes it back into the Garden of Eden, where the serpent deceived Eve. And he says, unless you are discerning, unless you learn to tell the difference, you can also be led astray. In other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying is that, Corinthians, do not be gullible. Grow up. There is a different Jesus being presented out there. There is a different spirit by which certain preachers are working. And he says, there is a different gospel that they need to be aware of and to watch out for. I would like to bring it to your attention that several of those Gospels are here with us today, just like the Apostle Paul talked to the Corinthians. And one case of such a Gospel is one we know now that is being propagated by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the ones that we commonly know as Mormons. Who are these Mormons? What makes their church unique? How distinctive are their teachings from biblical Christianity? How should Christian believers watch out or stand against the teachings of this church or this religious group? Does the Bible have anything to say about how true Christians should respond to people who are preaching a different gospel? If one of these days, Mormons or members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints knock on your door, how are you going to respond to them? Will you rebuke them? Will you close the door against them or run away? Or will you firmly stand by the word of God and correct them? And if you correct them, with what attitude? With what manner? Well, we will be looking at a few of some of those questions. But before we do that, I would like to share with you a bit on the history of this movement. Of course, today you will know them especially by the young missionaries that move around. I am sure you have seen some of these young missionaries, usually putting on white shirts, some dark pants with a tag written on elder so-and-so on the chest. Very smart guys, ever smiling, knocking on every door. And very persistent, by the way, seeking to share what they call the restored gospel. But who are these young men? They come from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This church has some scriptures, or what we call standard works of authority. Books they believe are inspired, and books which provide information that guides their beliefs and behaviors.
One of these key teachings or key scriptural authorities is what is known as the Book of Mormon. When you look at this Book of Mormon, in fact, it is written on another testament of Jesus Christ. Supposedly, this is a record of the ancient inhabitants of the Americas. They also have another book that is called Doctrines and Covenants, which mainly has revelations that were given to the founding prophet, Prophet Joseph Smith Jr. The third book that they use is called The Power of the Great Price. Some assorted things translated by Joseph Smith plus his first vision. They claim to believe in the Bible just like many Christians do, but with some quotation that only as far as it is correctly translated. And sometimes we are left wondering, when they say only as far as it is correctly translated, what do they mean? How can I tell which passages of the Bible are corrupted and which ones are not? And if some passages are corrupted, can we then have assurance that the whole Bible is really the inspired word of God? Well, we shall see as we go along. Where are these people coming from? Well, to look a bit at their history, the Mormon church started in the early 1800s. It claims that a young man named Joseph Smith Jr. wanted to know which church to join, and one day, as he was in prayer asking the Lord what he should do, he claims that the Heavenly Father and Jesus came down from heaven and spoke to him. And Jesus, as he claims, told him that he should not join any of the Christian churches of the time. Why? Because all the churches were wrong, their creeds were an abomination, and thirdly, that all those who professed those creeds were corrupt. Mormonism claims that God's truth became completely lost and perverted after the apostles died. They call the period between the apostles, death and Joseph Smith's vision, the great apostasy. Truth disintegrated because God's apostles and prophets were not around to protect it. But their priesthood authority was needed to continue God's work. So what did Joseph Smith do? According to him, God restored the true church and its priesthood authority through Joseph Smith. Several of the Bible characters are allegedly said that they came to him, like John the Baptist and the Apostle Peter, who it is claimed that they restored the priesthood to Smith by laying their hands on him and some of his friends. They further claim that an angel named Moroni led him to a nearby hill where he found gold plates with Egyptian writings on them. Smith took them to his home and translated them, and by the, by the gift and the power of God, so it is said. He said these gold plates were the record of Hebrew people who came from the Americas during the Babylonian, the Babylonian captivity. The translation of these plates became the Book of Mormon, which was eventually published in 1830. Now, so when you think about Mormonism, first of all, you think about Joseph Smith, the founder, the one who claims received the vision and God told him that all the churches were wrong, he couldn't join any, and eventually the true church is restored through him. But you also think about the authoritative teachings of the church, of which one of them is the Book of Mormon that he translated according to the same story. Now, what are some of the controversies that we usually find in Mormonism? What are some of those things that should bring concern to the Christian community? Well, I will mention at least two of them. Number one, polygamy. Number two, racism. It is said that in 1831, Joseph Smith received the revelation commanding him to practice polygamy. He and a few of his followers started practicing it in secret and teaching that it was required for eternal salvation. In fact, it is known that Billy Smith married at least 33 women, and at least 10 of those women were already married to other men at the same time. Wow. After Smith had died and the church moved to Utah, polygamy was practiced openly, bringing persecution to the church. In 1890, Wilford Woodruff, their fourth prophet, received a revelation that they should stop polygamy. So polygamy comes by a revelation to Joseph Smith, and in 1890, 
Wilford Woodruff received another revelation uh, commanding them to stop polygamy. The church still teaches that polygamy is practiced in heaven, however. Secondly, we talk about racism as one of the things that should really concern Christian believers. The Mormon church has a history of racist doctrines. The Book of Mormon in fact teaches that Native American Indians have a dark skin because God cast them and their ancestors. So what, is their, what does their growth look like? Well, in the United States where they were founded, since the church was organized by Joseph Smith in 1830, it has always had 12 apostles and one prophet. The headquarters currently are in Utah, and this is since 19, rather since 1847. The church claims 15 million members worldwide in over 150 nations. Currently, it is believed that about 85,000 full-time missionaries are already working to promote and create visibility for the Mormon church. In Uganda, by 1991, there were at least 99 members of the church. And by 2013, there were about 12,380 members. No doubt, some re remarkable growth. But why are people joining this church, especially in light of these controversies, in light of the visions that you and I would agree are very questionable? Why is it that people still find it easy to join this church? Well, as we look at Mormon theology, you will realize that there are a number of things that would easily attract people into the group. Especially when you think about this part of Africa, you, people are looking for opportunities. It is very easy for a young man who has met a Mormon missionary to be convinced that if he becomes a Mormon, he could get either educational opportunities abroad or even traveling just for a wonderful opportunity of leaving Uganda. That itself is an attraction to join the church. But we also have missionary opportunities where if somebody became a Mormon and trains to be a missionary, he has an opportunity to be sent in a different countries where he can do his missionary work. That itself is appealing. But Mormons also have a, sp a, a strong emphasis on family, unity, and relations. And in most cases, when you look at a Mormon family, it looks like an ideal family. Great love, great bonding, wonderful relationship within the family, at least externally it seems so. And this is also very appealing, especially in times like this where marriages are breaking down and families are splitting apart. It is not a wonder that this would create an appeal that when one is a Mormon, then his family will always be strong and royal and loving and bonding. But we also have a number of teachings that Mormons will bring to your attention that create an appeal. One of those would, for instance, be baptism on behalf of the dead. If you heard that there is an opportunity for you to be baptized on behalf of a loved one, and that loved one has an opportunity of going to heaven, who would not take such an opportunity? Who would not want such an appeal? And so Mormonism will teach you that you can be baptized on behalf of your loved ones who died before they were Mormons, and that gives them another opportunity to go to a higher level of glory even after they have died. We have also uh, appeals like the teaching on eternal marriage, where it is believed in Mormonism that once you become a Mormon and you are sealed in the temple, your marriage will last forever. So rather than saying, till death do us part, as we Christians always say, Mormons would quickly and gladly want to remind you that as a Mormon, your marriage will last forever. Those are some of the things that create appeal or attraction for people joining Mormonism. And I believe that we will even shed more light on some of them as we begin to explore the Mormon theology. Now, how do we understand Mormon theology? And what makes it distinctive from historic biblical Christianity? Well, to understand Mormon theology very well, you need to understand it through asking three important questions. Number one, where did we come from? Number two, why are we here? And number three, where are we going? 
For Bible-believing Christians, we believe that our existence started here. You need to read Zechariah chapter 12, verse, 11, verse 1, and you will see what the prophet Zechariah prophesies as he says that the Lord forms the spirit of man from within. And of course, from Genesis chapter, three, chapter th uh, 2, as we look at the creation of man, we are told about how God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed in him, and the man became a living being. So according to Christian theology, man's existence begins right here on earth. But not so with Mormonism. According to Mormonism, before we came on earth, we existed. We were born as spirit children to our heavenly father and heavenly mother on another planet. When the Bible says that God is our father, Mormons take it very literally. So they argue, if we have a father in heaven, we surely must have a mother there also. So they believe in a heavenly father and a heavenly mother, and they believe that we were procreated as spirit children. And then they further say that while we were still in heaven, there was one time a council that was called by God, and God wanted to unfold the plan of salvation. Jesus, who is believed to be our elder brother and the spirit brother of Lucifer, was chosen to be the savior of the world. But Lucifer didn't like it. He would have loved to be the savior instead. So according to Mormon theology, there was a war in heaven, and it is believed that a third of the spirit children in heaven fought along with Lucifer. And when they were defeated, they became demons and God did not allow them to have a physical body because of fighting against him. And for those who fought well on the side of God, we were given a chance to have bodies and to live for a time on earth. So if you are here on earth, it is one indication that you fought on the side of God and now you have been given a body to come on earth for a while so that you can go through another phase of testing. And of course for demons, they will never know that opportunity because they cannot have physical bodies. And this brings us to our second question. Why are we here? If we were given physical bodies to come here on earth for a while, what is the purpose of our being here? Of course, as Christians, again, we have a different understanding from the scriptures. According to the Bible, humankind are not on earth for themselves. God has created them for his own glory. According to Colossians 1 verse 16 and Romans 11 verse 36. We are here because God has created us in his own image that we might live to his glory and whatever we might do must always be aimed at glorifying God. But not so with Mormonism again. According to Mormonism, we are here to be tested. The earth life is sometimes called our probation or the second estate. And according to them, if we pass the test, we will obtain not just eternal life, Eternal life is often called exaltation in Mormonism. And these are the various tests that we must undergo while we are here on earth. The first one is obedience. We are here to obey God, and once we obey God, then we will have passed the test in the area of obedience. And according to the book of Mormon, it says that we know that it is by grace that we are saved. After all, we can do, according to 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 23. So when you think about Christianity and salvation, the fact that we need to be reconciled to God as sinful human beings, in Mormonism it is not so. We are really not saved by God's grace. We are saved by what we can do, and that's how we fulfill or we pass the test of our being here on earth. There are certain things that are expected of us, which each, if we do and do well, then we will pass the test. Joseph Smith said that to get salvation, we must not only do some things, but everything which God commanded. Can you believe it? everything which God commanded. And as you can understand, there is no one who can obey everything at all times. God gave his child, the children of Israel the law, but no one could fulfill all the law at all times. 
And that is why our hope of salvation can only be found in God and through his grace because human effort has failed and it will always fail. But according to Mormonism, you must fulfill certain obligations. There are certain do's and don'ts that you must do. You must abstain from things like coffee, like tea, like alcohol, like tobacco. You must be married and if, even sealed eternally. You must be giving a full 10% of your income to the church. But that is not all. That's just the area of obedience. For instance, you must be baptized, and not just any baptism, by the way, but a baptism which must be performed by a member or a man who has the Mormon priesthood authority. Then you must have faith in Jesus. Even if somebody could stop sinning, he would still need atonement provided by Jesus to be saved. But which Jesus do we trust? Not the Jesus of the Bible, who is the second person of the Trinity and who has been God and who provides eternal life through his finished work. Instead, we should have faith in the Mormon Jesus, our older brother from the pre-existence. So when we think about faith in Jesus, we are not talking about this confident trust and resting on the finished work of Jesus. And fourthly, you have the idea of the temple work. Mormons have special meeting places all over the world called temples. Currently, I think in Africa, we have about three of them. And these are very different than their regular churches, and only worthy few are allowed to enter. In the temple, they perform baptisms for the dead and secret endowment rituals like marriage for eternity. There are three temples, like I already said before, in Africa today, one in Ghana, another in Nigeria, another in South Africa, and with two more being planned in the Democratic Republic of Congo and another one in South Africa. But thirdly, where are we going after this life? If we are here to pass a test, and we are going to pass the test through obedience, through baptism, through faith in the Mormon Jesus, not that, and through fulfilling the temple rituals and endowments, where are we going after this life? Supposing we have fulfilled all these things, or maybe even when we have not, but we have died, what next? Now in Mormonism, after the resurrection, almost everyone who lived on earth will be assigned one of the three heavens or the degrees of glory. So according to Mormonism, there are three heavens or three degrees of glory. The highest being the celestial kingdom. And according to Mormon teaching, everyone who keeps the commandments will go there. Remember, not some of the commandments, all the commandments will go to the celestial kingdom as if any would ever fulfill that. But secondly, there is on, there is the, this is the only degree of glory where God is. And if you are in the lower kingdom, you will never be with him. Very important to note, according to Mormon doctrine, if you never go to the first level of heaven or the first degree of glory, you will never see God. God only is in the celestial kingdom and nowhere else. People in the celestial kingdom can become gods who create their own planets and have spirit children and send their offspring to be born as mortals just like the gods before us. The Mormon curriculum says that our father in heaven was once a man, as we are now, capable of physical death. By obedience to eternal gospel principles, he progressed from one stage of life to another until he attained the state that we call exaltation or godhood. And that is especially quoted in Achieving a Celestial Marriage on page 132. So you can see that the Mormon conception or idea of God is not only contradicting biblical understanding, but is very much fraud. The God of Mormonism was once a man. And if you enter the celestial kingdom, you also have an opportunity to become gods. But there is the middle kingdom, or the middle level, which is called the terrestrial kingdom. This is also called the broad road, and most people will end up here according to Mormon teaching. And this is for all the good people of the world who were not good enough. So in Mormonism, there is such an idea as 
you were good but not good enough to be in the celestial kingdom where you will see God but maybe good uh, to some extent for the second level which we call the terrestrial kingdom and the lowest and the thirdest is the terrestrial kingdom and people who go there are the liars the sorcerers the adulterers the whoremongers uh, according to their book or one of their standard works doctrine and covenants but one Mormon manual says that even the terrestrial kingdom, the lowest of the three, is a place of indescribable glory. Yes, you might not see God, but at least the level you are in is a level of indescribable glory. Now you will agree with me that that's not what the scriptures say about the afterlife. As Christians, we know that there are two places. If you are a Christian, when you die, you are received into heaven in the presence of our God and if you are not a Christian and you die you are uh, held up until the day of resurrection and then you will be judged or you will stand before the judgment throne of God before you are cast into the, the, the hellfire for eternal destruction but according to Mormonism there are three heavens depending on how you performed and that doctrine is also contrary to what God has revealed in his word. There is no doubt, friends, that Mormonism is a different gospel propagated by false preachers, teaching by a different spirit, presenting a different Jesus. And I would like to warn you and especially to charge you as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that now more than ever before we need to be very careful we need to understand what we believe and stand firm in the faith that Christ has given us that we might not be led astray by some of the subtle deceptions of Mormonism when you listen to them as they present the gospel to you at first it sounds like it is Christian after all the name of the church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints they will come holding a Bible and there is that temptation to think uh, maybe we are all Christians it's just that we define things differently but as you go along you begin to realize that Mormon theology goes far away from the standard teaching of the Bible and as such Christians should shun it as such Christians should identify Mormon members as non-believers and therefore candidates of evangelism and that means that we must lovingly and patiently reach out to them with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As you have heard, the salvation theology in Mormonism is really a salvation by works. It is the things that you do to pass the test that qualify you for a certain degree of glory. And of course you will all know as believers that salvation by works is not the teaching of the Bible. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2 from verses 6 to 8 when he says that for it is by grace that we have been saved not of works lest any man should boast. So when we reach out to these Mormon missionaries and members we need to reach them with the gospel of God's grace so that they can understand that we rest on the finished work of Jesus Christ and that without God's grace no man can be saved. You want to help them understand the impossibility of finding forgiveness in the Mormon structure of salvation by works. You want to help them understand what Christ has already done on th for them and why they now must by faith receive this which Christ has done on their behalf in order to find eternal life. When you talk to them, please be polite and kind. Remember that they are also human beings. Yes, they are in error, but they are still God's image bearers, and God loves them enough that Jesus died on their account too. So be polite, be kind, and remember that you yourself has become a Christian, not because of how smart you are or how much truth you knew, but because God lavished his grace upon you. Please, I want to remind you that in this struggle of not just understanding false religious groups, but most importantly of affirming our Christian faith, it is dependent upon us that we understand the word of God, we study the scriptures thoroughly and carefully, because only by knowing God's revealed truth can we tell the difference between that truth and the error.
Like someone has said, if you want to know what is counterfeit money, you must know what genuine money looks like. Do you know the truth of God's word? Do you understand this once for all revealed faith that we are being called upon to contend for? Knowing the truth of God's word will keep you safe from the erroneous teachings of religious groups. Will put you in a position where you can discern. Will put you in a place where you can effectively guard, warn, protect, and watch over your loved ones. May the Lord bless you.